a slight variation of the title, but it's basically very similar. Uh, as, as gynecologists, we're talking about redo surgery, which means that surgery has been done before, and then there is a reason to do it again. And this talk is dedicated to reasons why that might be necessary. Um, these are my affiliations. Um, I am affiliated with two universities and Bart's Health, and I also work as an editor for a journal that deals with gynecology on no conflicts of interest. So why would you consider repeat surgery? I often get women coming to my clinic uh, who had surgery before, sometimes many years ago, and they are considering a second surgery or sometimes third or more surgeries. So first surgery might have not helped with the pain or might have just helped for a very short time. Now, um, how do we define whether it has helped with the pain or hasn't helped with the pain? So there, there are ways of um, setting uh, yardsticks. And uh, if you want to sort of measure if, if surgery has helped, uh, we want the pain relief to be at least a third less. So in, in that is how, how medics define a significant drop in pain relief. Um, but many, many of my patients actually get more than a third, but a minimum a third, and you want it to be longer than six months. Why is that? In the first six months, um, there might be an element of recuperation. So you might be still getting from, better from surgery, or there might be something called the placebo effect, that there was so much hope pinned on the surgery that it initially feels you get better. But then after six months, everything feels painful again. So then that surgery um, is defined as it hasn't really sustainably reduced pain. Um, sometimes pain goes away for many years after surgery and then comes back. And this is a this is an encouraging sign. If, if pain can be reduced for, for a long time after this first surgery, the same might be achievable after further surgery. Um, and then there are people who are getting surgery every few years, and that is not very desirable because. It involves having to recuperate from surgery. Um, every surgery causes a bit of microtrauma. Uh, if repeated surgery is, is done on the ovaries, that could harm the eggs on the ovaries. So ideally, um, you know, if you had two or three surgeries in your 20s and early 30s already, you might want to sit down with your endometriosis doctor and and think about other other options or how the time between surgeries can be more spaced out. There might be surgery um, in someone who was known to have en had endometriosis on previous laparoscopy several years ago and now the fertility doctors say oh the ovarian cysts that would interfere with our fertility treatment or the ovaries are stuck in a space where uh, during the fertility treatment, it's hard to, to reach. And, and then in preparation for IVF, the other thing that might happen is if the fallopian tubes are filled with fluid um, before fertility treatment, sometimes these fallopian tubes get clipped. So the fluid doesn't flow back into the womb and wash out the embryo. And sometimes um, there is a, a situation where endometriosis is strangulating the ureter. And here, ureter, we're talking these little tubes that drain the urine from the blood, uh, from the kidneys into the bladder. And if endometriosis puts it put onto the ureter, the urine then backs back into the kidney and can damage the kidney. So Ureter endometriosis is something that you don't want to sit on. Uh, or a um, endometriosis cyst on the ovary 
show suspicious features and um, these suspicious features are well recognized and well described and they usually occur in very large cysts so that, that we're talking about seven ten centimeters and if they are finger like uh, lesions in the wall of the cyst then um, these cysts are classed as suspicious and if nothing is done they could over the years develop into a pre-cancer or a cancerous change and that might be a, a very rare reason for having to do repeat surgery. So the, the question that I asked in the beginning, getting better after surgery, um, it might be useful to think about what causes pain in endometriosis. So simply having the inflama inflammation in the body from endometriosis causes pain. Um, the other thing that causes pain, endometriosis is a bit like superglue, and it just loves to stick things together and make the pelvic organs much less flexible, uh, including the top of the vagina. So there might be bowel stuck to the back of the uterus and the food can't pass easily and there might be bad bloating. Uh, and there could be a sort of a change of anatomy because things are stuck together and not move smoothly. And that can cause pain in endometriosis, especially painful sex. Um, so the, these are the things that, that contribute to pain. Um, and another reason for not getting better after last surgery is that uh, during surgery, a uh, technique was used that was uh, not sufficient. For instance, if um, someone had surface endometriosis, uh, it is oftentimes seems to be good enough to cauterize that. But if the endometriosis goes more than a few millimeters uh, deeper into the body, the uh, right technique would be to actually um, cut it out rather than just melting it. Um, sometimes the uh, surgery, especially if a, a more of a sort of generalist gynecologist who doesn't do mainly endometriosis, might be good at removing the ovarian cyst, but then there is something called a plaque, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time. So remember that word, I'll show you in the um, next few slides what a plaque is. It is a it is a bit of very dense and what we call fibrotic scarred tissue with interspersed active endometriosis cells that lives at the very top of the vagina and that plaque um, can, can suck the ovaries and the bowels in and when you hear the ovaries are stuck towards the back of the uterus it is that plaque that does it. So if you imagine a sellotape that's sticky from both sides, that is an endometriosis plaque. And the idea is uh, to unstick everything during surgery and then to cut this sticky tape out. So cut the plaque out as well. Otherwise, things can immediately stick themselves back together again. Um, sometimes there might be this plaque left behind but because a medication called Zolodex or Prostap is given after surgery, there is the impression that the pain is gone. And then when the Zolodex or the Prostap, which are anti-hormones, uh, when they are stopped, the pain comes back because the pain was actually masked because the plaque was still there. Okay. So I am using a pointer. So we're going through different state. The red bits is uh, endometriosis cells. So these are cells that should be actually inside the uterus lining the, um, the uh, uterine cavity and making a period every month, but mother nature has put them in the wrong place. And here, if you imagine the vagina is down here and these bands here, they're called uterosacral ligaments. And here, these little dots means that in the early stage, this plaque is just about to form. And here we have it much stronger. So that's that sticky tape that loves to, yeah, in, a, in a higher stage endometriosis, a, a sort of made an adhesion band, a scar tissue band between the ovary that has now uh, a cyst and the plaque. So if you remove the artesians, uh, treat the ovary, but leave the plaque behind, then 
these adhesions can reform very, very soon. Okay, so the, it takes a little bit of an advanced technique to take this plaque away. And because once it's gone, it leaves the shape of a butterfly. So imagine cut this out and cut this out. It's like a butterfly with two wings. So we call it the butterfly excision. Yeah? So that would be a good, good question to ask in a consultation. You know, if, if there is a plaque behind the uterus, would you be able to cut it out at the same time? Um, surgery, in my view, is always one part of a multi-pronged approach to um, endometriosis pain. And oftentimes, mm, surgery is is a chapter that you start in your journey and I think it's an ideal time to think about uh, other things that you can do yourself and then the the time of surgery where you're off, off work possibly not as active that can be then invested in thinking or and exploring these non um non-surgical approaches. So in the first instance, good sleep quality. Yoga, and this lady is practicing a school of yoga called restorative yoga, where there's deep stretches and restful postures. Exercise can release endorphins and um, running is very popular, but I think speed walking, swimming, these are all good things. And, and sometimes it's something that surgery sort of opens the door of doing more of that because there is a significant pain reduction. Um, now we are coming to this middle bit. CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Um, so this is often done by psychologists or counselors. And here um, it is sort of looking at the interplay of our emotions of our thinking and of our behavior. And when I'm talking about these, this technique of cognitive behavioral therapy, I'm not saying pain is all in your head, it's not real, it's not that at all. I think people who suffer from a chronic condition, or let's say I believe that living with a chronic condition, um, we have deserved to get some coaching, um, living well, with a chronic condition, in this case, living well with endometriosis, because what, what often happens with endometriosis, because there is um, permanent pain, the whole body pain system becomes quite sensitized and always on edge. So if we have these relaxation techniques or this psychological approach, we can, we can dampen down the, um, the pain response of the body. And this is scientifically proven and it seems to be as good as heavy duty drugs like antidepressants. So I haven't talked about this thing. You might ask yourself, what is this cardboard thing? So this cardboard cutout is a picture of the pelvic floor muscles. And like my shoulder muscles after a long day at work can get quite tense, the pelvic floor muscles can also get really tense. Uh, and sometimes, even after surgery, the tension stays, the pain memory remains in the body. And then this pelvic floor can actually be loosened up and these muscle knots can be massaged out. Uh, and the uh, physiotherapists that do this have special training in pelvic floor relaxation work and trigger point work. So if you if you have a physiotherapist uh, who is basically trained in incontinence work in learning to tighten the pelvic floor, that wouldn't be exactly the right training. That what we want is pelvic floor relaxation and massaging the muscle knots out. Um, the, that's a very, very useful thing. I've had a very good feedback of, uh, you know, women, women who have um, ha uh, participated in a few sessions with a physiotherapist. So this is not the butterfly that I was talking about earlier. This is a heat unit that you can uh, stick on your tummy 
where it hurts most and then wear it under your clothes. It can be charged like a mobile phone. And apart from heat, it can also emit healing electricity. So a little tingling massage and, and that can be very, very useful. Also in the sister condition of endometriosis called adenomyosis, this uh, I had good feedback. And finally, diet. I already said that sometimes the bowel is slightly pulled out of its natural path. Uh, and people can get bloating from that or people can get bloating because of the inflammation in the body. So um, ovaries and bowels are very close neighbors. And I often get that complaint. I look like nine months pregnant and it's all gas inside the body. Where is the gas coming from? Um, on the red part of this page here, uh, there's a list of different sugars. There's fruit sugar, there's milk sugar, there is sugar contained in uh, gluten and um, dairy. And all these um, chemicals, they can ferment in the body and make gas. Um, and the idea is to take print off this, this picture and then Choose one food group at the time, let's say lactose, dairy, cut that out for several weeks, including ideally the time when you are be worse, like for instance, uh, leading up to a period, and then make a note whether leaving out the dairy has actually helped you. And then if not, you just have dairy again and move on to the next column, the gluten, for instance. Yeah, uh, giving up all things on the bottom half makes a very restrictive diet and you will never find your triggers. Okay. Um, tales of caution. I'm asking myself and I would encourage everyone to ask themselves, how, how was your first response to the first surgery? If there was hardly any response, why do you think might it be better the second time around. So th these are things that uh, are good ideas to bring up in a doctor-patient um, chat when you get the chance to be seen in clinic. Um, ask about prognosis. What do I mean with prognosis? I mean, how likely is the surgery to make me better? How likely is the surgery to help with painful sex? How likely is it to make the periods better? What will it do to my bowel? Because uh, oftentimes the location of where the endometriosis is, is related to your symptoms. So endometriosis that is at the very top of the vagina is linked to painful sex. So this plaque I was talking about, that uh, removing that plaque could make the symptom of painful sex much better. Um, my, my own work and analysis from other um, units have shown that if there are ovarian cysts and, and this plaque, so deep endometriosis, and this plaque and the cysts are removed, these women seem to have quite a, a strong pain relief from surgery. Whereas oftentimes people with more surface endometriosis, the surgery might not be the deal breaker. And it might take other things that I showed on the previous slide to get the full healing response. Uh, I already mentioned before that it repeat uh, surgery on the ovaries to remove cysts overall it hurts the eggs that live on the ovary. So that is something that should be carefully discussed with your doctor. And then you want a suitably experienced team. So, for instance, if it is quite obvious that you have a, this, this plaque, which can be felt during a gentle internal examination, when the, the womb might be tilted back and stuck to the plaque, and there might be this roughness at the very top of the vagina. So, uh, if, if the, that is the case, and there's a suspicion of, you know, the, the stronger, the more advanced type of deep endometriosis with the plaque, then it's important that you have a surgical team who can deal with this. And uh, how, do, how do you find these people? So the first surgery is really the most important because if, if the first surgery completely removes the endometriosis, that's a fantastic 
starting point. Uh, and if the endometriosis is a little deeper than expected and you have a surgeon who can deal with that, they can then uh, deal with that on the day and not leave any endometriosis behind. Um, during surgery, this condition called adenomyosis, the sensitive swollen uterus, can also be observed. So there are some indirect tests where you can nudge the uterus a little bit and see if you can make a dent into that uterus. Yeah, that's soft spongy uterus. That's condition called adenomyosis, sister condition to endometriosis. That might be the case. Um, so a good question to ask your surgeon, do you use the burning technique or do you use the cutting out technique? And if you find the endometriosis is more than expected, could you then switch to the cutting technique or would I then have to, you know, would you put me on medication or send me to a different unit? Um, and the other thing, the important thing that you want is um, with quite severe endometriosis that affects the bladder and the bowel, uh, that your gynecologist has networking with a bladder specialist and a bowel specialist. So if endometriosis turns out to go into the wall of the bladder or bowel, that it can be appropriately treated in the unit. How do you find these people? So you go on to the BSG, the British Society of Gynecological Endoscopy, bit of a tongue twister. So endoscopy means uh, laparoscopy and hysteroscopy. So we're talking keyhole surgery. So this society of keyhole surgeons keeps a list of centers that have to be, um, they are externally accredited. So people have to show that they are up to the job every year. Uh, and the names you will find in this list on this website uh, indicates that you are in the hands of an expert. How do you prepare yourself for surgery, if at all possible, uh, especially if it's a high stakes operation, if you suffer a lot of pain, if the endometriosis is thought to be quite deep and quite extensive, try and talk to the surgical team before to ask the important questions and encourage a conversation about the prognosis. Also, what can be done if the surgery is, is less less of a healing experience than initially thought. And then getting ready for surgery. I, I gave a previous webinar on this new idea of prehabilitation, which means getting your physical and your mental health in the best possible state before you have surgery. I often hear, oh, I feel so terrible. I, I need the surgery now. And, and then I'm asking myself, is that the right time to have surgery when you're completely at, at the end of what your, what your mind and what your body can take? Because going through surgery adds sort of a, additional strain on both body and mind. And so, uh, I've, you know, through CBT and, and some of the things that I mentioned before, if it is possible to get into a, a good uh, mental and physical state before surgery, that is, that is very good. Um, and, and also, um, I think taking sufficient time off to recover afterwards is important because it's not only a mental and uh, a physical thing, it's also a mental thing. And I've had people who physically were able to go back to work and then um, the mental strain of being at the workplace, you know, people felt really uh, they were not quite ready and went back too early. Uh, here I am going to talk a little bit about a hysterectomy because sometimes with repeat surgery, um, there is this feeling, oh, you know, had enough, now we're taking out everything. Um, is that a good or a bad thing? And the answer is it's an individual thing. So, first of all, uh, I would like to say that there is a possibility that a hysterectomy can improve pain, but it would also, it takes away the chance to have babies or think about having babies. And uh, in a proportion of women that is associated with feelings of regret and grief, uh, but not in everyone. Um, between 10 and 50% of women 
still have um, pain despite having had the uh, hysterectomy. And I think the people who respond best to, uh, to get the biggest benefit are from the hysterectomy are people who have the condition called adenomyosis and have issues related to the period rather than just daily pain. Um, so the guidelines stipulate that the best way of doing the hysterectomy in endometriosis would be with keyhole surgery, because then you can see, is there any endometriosis left um, at the same time that can also be removed. And here in this picture, that black stuff here, that is another example of a plaque. And here I've even made it strangulate the ureter. So it goes into these ligaments at the top of the vagina. So if a special form of hysterectomy, a subtotal hysterectomy would be hysterectomy that leaves the cervix behind. This is the cervix and the subtotal hysterectomy would be taking out the body of the uterus. And it's often done by people who can't remove that type of endometriosis. They just see the endometriosis and say, oh, that's too difficult. We'll just take out the top of the uterus. Unfortunately, that then means that the endometriosis is still there. And the, the part of the uterus that was actually quite healthy has been removed. So a subtotal hysterectomy would usually not be a good choice in endometriosis. Um, the other question is what to do with the ovaries, whether they should come out at the same time of a hysterectomy or should stay in. And the UK guidance, they bias, they, they're quite pro removing the ovaries because the ovaries make hormones that can feed future endometriosis. Um, however, if all the endometriosis is removed I, and the ovaries are not full of cysts, I would more go with the American guidance and not necessarily remove the ovary, especially if there is several years unto the age of the menopause. Surgical menopause is what happens if ovaries are removed at the time, uh, the time of uh, surgery prior to the natural age of menopause, which is late 40s, early 50s. And as I said before, it's done in the, with the intention to um, prevent endometriosis from coming back. Uh, but I think it's worthwhile talking about the pros and cons of ovarian removal prior to surgery and have a good think about it. Because once the ovaries are removed, they can't easily be put back again. Um, and the, the benefit of removing ovaries is that uh, endometriosis recurrence is, is less likely. Um, and uh, it's very uh, ovarian cysts also don't come back. Um, but what can happen is that hot flushes, mood swings, low sex drive, sleep disturbances, all these things can happen much more, much faster than with the natural menopause. Um, and, and then some people find that they don't do so well with HRT and they're left with the menopause symptoms. So that is really an important area to explore. And HRT options, people are then worried, oh, will the HRT flare up endometriosis again? Uh, but thankfully, that is not often the case. So uh, Tibolone is, is a HRT that can be used safely with a very low risk of flares or estrogen as patches or gel. And if the ovaries are removed, there is one other hormone that is then lacking in the body, and that is testosterone, which you will usually think, oh, it's more a male hormone, but especially around at the time of the menopause and after the menopause, testosterone is produced by the ovaries and that is good for libido, so for sex drive. And if that is missing, people might experience lack of sex drive. Finally, one slide on hormones and hormone blockers. In relation to surgery, they can be an alternative to surgery. So an alternative, for instance, to repeat surgery could be to go on the pill. 
uh, either combined or a mini pill where mini pill is not very strong, but let's say pill injection or a Mirena coil could be a hormonal way of keeping endometriosis symptoms at bay. Uh, sometimes prior to surgery, it is given to make the endometriosis uh, cells less. After surgery, it can be given as a prevention of endometriosis coming back. Uh, so this is the role of, for instance, let's say the pill. Um, and then there are these GnRH analogs, which are hormone blockers. These are the ones that introduce a artificial menopause. And they are ordinarily, the recommendation is just to use it prior to surgery to make the endometriosis less and the surgery safer. Um, but in some cases, it can be used longer term as maintenance to keep endometriosis suppressed uh, or not having to do more surgery. Um, what I hear more and more, and Emma and I we were chatting just before we went live, uh, how hormones, especially the hormone called progesterone, in some people can cause PMS and sometimes even more, even stronger emotional side effects like depression. So that is a, a field that needs more looking into. And I hear since the pandemic, I, I believe that um, mental health has become more um, talked about. And, and I sometimes hear that um, women tell me, oh, I can't, I can't do the pill. I, I feel really bad when I take the pill. But the pill, for instance, or the Mirena system are tried and tested ways of uh, ensuring at least to a certain degree, that endometriosis doesn't come back so soon. Yeah? Um, I've, I get uh, the same question comes over and over again. Is there anything non-hormonal I can do? And I've looked into the literature. It's not obvious that there's nothing that that is clearly as strong a prevention of endometriosis coming back as, as hormones. But... Uh, there might be a role in a plant-based diet and there might be a role in exercise because both of them can lower estrogen levels and estrogen feeds endometriosis. Um, there is a bioidentical hormone called eutrogestane, which is very, very gentle and well tolerated, but currently it's used in the context of HRT. Uh, however, some people have used it for endometriosis and and liked it. So I think more research is needed. It's quite a low dose, it's quite a weak medication. And we, we are not really sure if it is effective, but it has fewer side effects. And then the IUS stands for intrauterine system, which is for instance, a Mirena coil. Okay, so the last slide is really dedicated to this decision-making, this discussion with the surgeon or the clinical team prior to surgery, thinking about pros and cons, thinking about options, asking about experience, asking about unexpected findings. So these are very, very valuable questions. And as a, uh, as a mature and adult patient, it's well within your rights to, to ask these questions. And talking about questions, we can move to the question part now. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for all of the information. Um, my first question is, what happens if they don't find anything during your surgery? Uh, yes. So not finding anything during surgery. Um, let me let me share again. Um, Okay, um, it's, a, it's a condition called non-structural pelvic pain. So the, the uh, surgeon has looked into the favorite spots where endometriosis usually grows, in front of the uterus, behind the uterus, under the ovary. So all, all these spots are hot spots for endometriosis. It's not there. Um, it, we might be dealing with this condition called adenomyosis. And that can be picked up on ultrasound scan. Um, 
with an experienced person and the question uh, needs to be asked is there adenomyosis and then through some measurements and pattern recognition the sonographer can pick it up uh, or there might be a condition called non-structural pelvic pain where there might be bowel spasm there might be bladder sensitivity um, and that is a real condition and uh, we've moved away from using negative terms like negative laparoscopy because where there is pain it needs to be acknowledged so let's uh, say the laparoscopy didn't identify endometriosis so all these options here are very valuable and worthwhile exploring and the other one is hormones in in uh, non-structural pelvic pain the hormone progesterone like uh, for instance used in the Mirena system <clears throat> or the pill injection or even the combined pill can be very very effective yeah so the the things that i explored here perhaps seeing a bladder specialist and um thinking about hormones that would be my starter starter package for this problem thank you Thank you. And would the surgeon check for ureter um, endometriosis during a laparoscopy? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, the ureter looks, it's visible. It's not just a, a mental construct. It, it's a visible tube that runs at the side of the body uh, and and it moves like a worm. That's why we, the, the Greek word is vermiculate. So it, it has that sort of worm-like movement. And uh, if endometriosis is overlying uh, the ureter, uh, then you need a technique where you cut it out rather than burning, because if there's burning and the burning gets transmitted to the ureter, it can damage the ureter. So that is an advanced technique. I, I sometimes hear uh, women who tell me, oh, I had endometriosis over the ureter, but this surgeon said I, I left I left it there um, because they, they didn't have the technique. And then when I go there, uh, I just scrape it off, cut it out, and it's not an issue. Thank you. Um, what's the difference between endometriosis and endometrioma? And is surgery necessary for an endometrioma? Yeah, so an endometrioma is a special form of endometriosis. It is endometriosis on the ovary. So what happens is that within the ovary, there's a blood-filled blister where every month, because the blister is lined with wallpaper, that makes a period every month. As I said before, endometriosis cells make a period every month. So uh, on the ovary, we now have this blister that fills up over time with period blood. So that is an endometrioma. And the question is whether, and endometriosis refers to everything that could be this plaque, that could be implants in other parts of the body. So endometriosis is the umbrella term and endometrioma refers to endometriosis of the ovary. Whether it needs surgery or not depends on the circumstances. The fertility um, experts tell us uh, if you have an endometrioma or an endometriosis cyst on the ovary that doesn't cause pain and is small, and here we, we the four centimeters or less, watch and wait is the best because the ovary, in order to get rid of that endometrioma, you have to do some cutting on the ovary and you hurt some of the eggs on the ovary so the risk benefit um, ratio wouldn't be right for a small endometrioma but if there are symptoms um, and the endometrioma is large then it makes sense to remove it thank you lisa and is hysterectomy okay if your bowel is involved and if no why uh, if the bowel is involved and a hysterectomy is indicated then it needs to be done in a certain setting where the bowel surgeon is there and can help unstick the bowel from this plaque. Yeah, you remember where we did this subtotal picture of subtotal hysterectomy? 
If there's now no bowel surgeon and the bowel is stuck to here and the doctor says, oh, I'm just decapitating the uterus, that wouldn't be so good. So if endometriosis is stuck to the bowel, you don't want a subtotal hysterectomy. You want the bowel surgeon to remove the endometriosis and to separate bowel and endometriosis. So uh, to separate bowel and uterus, so the uterus can be removed during the hysterectomy without hurting the bowel. Thank you. And what is the recovery period after surgery and when will you feel better? Uh, it it depends a little bit on how how well or unwell you felt before. Uh, as I I alluded to that earlier on, that if you are really run down, then anything will be more difficult. Um, as a rule of thumb, uh, for someone who who is relatively well in themselves with an element of chronic pain but not severely disabled, within two weeks you can do most things that involve um, house things in the house. So be, after two weeks you'd be able to clean windows, uh, <laughs> you'd be able to hoover. Uh, and the more sort of sports related things, more exercise related things are more for week three and four. Uh, if there has been major bowel surgery, I would probably take six weeks off work um, and then book um, review with the GP. But for average endometriosis, uh, I think going back to work after roughly three weeks should be should be okay. But I think two weeks is always a good mark to ask yourself how how well am I, how resilient am I to withstand um, the work stress. If um if you don't feel better at the the end of of those weeks, is there anything that can be done um to um. I don't know for people, I've got a question here about um, going back to work um, and doctors know not, not covering a longer amount of time. Is there anything that can be done about increasing the recovery time in the note yeah. or anything? Yeah, so if um, it, it really depends on what, what symptoms there, there are. So let's uh, assume there is ongoing abdominal pain. Um, I, I, I spoke, I touched a little bit on seeing your surgery as the start of a new chapter where um, healthier lifestyles could be explored. So for instance, the, the bowels remain sensitive, even though endometriosis is removed in many cases. So during that time of re recuperation, it might be a good time to find out what foods cause upset in the system or using this heated TENS unit might be a good thing or doing the restorative yoga and there's a lot on YouTube that can help with that. Um, if it's very period related and there's no contraceptive hormones, it could be uh, a good idea. It might be a good idea to go on hormones. Um, it might be worthwhile talking to your surgical team or if there's a, a specialist nurse in your unit and say, look, I'm struggling. It's been six weeks and I still don't feel great. Um, sometimes a, a review can be done or an ultrasound can be done to see if there's a, a little bit of a blood collection somewhere. But uh, in the vast majority of cases, if it hasn't settled after after six weeks, another two weeks might might be actually when at the time when you turn the corner for the better. Thank you. And is there an age limit for surgery? Well, uh, the again, it, it depends on the individual situation. Um, so for period related symptoms, I think the closer you get to the menopause, um, the more likely is that mother nature will do the healing um, and something smaller than repeat surgery, something gentler might be tried like using the Mirena coil or perhaps uh, even using a hormone blocker 
for a few months to just bridge until the periods stop naturally um, rather than having you know big time repeat surgery before the menopause because after the menopause many 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 people get better okay um and so this is quite a wordy question apologies if it's um it's like more of a per person to person question mm -hmm. um but but we'll see how it goes so this person's been diagnosed of a dill endometriosis on the bladder with a nodule being found there and is also on on the bowel and they need surgery is this common and would it recur in in these areas after surgery um it is <coughs> it um i see it relatively commonly but then i work in an endometriosis center and i think the question the the person asking that question should be looked after in an endometriosis center because that networking between the bladder surgeon and the bowel surgeon is really important. So there might be a role of taking hormones or hormone blockers in preparation for the surgery to shrink the endometriosis so that the surgery doesn't mean removing so much bowel or part of the bladder. Uh, and then there is the question of how deep has the endometriosis gone into the bladder and bowel and that is often done by either a specialized ultrasound scan or an MRI scan so that before surgery it can be planned do we need to remove a little patch of bowel or can we just sort of scrape it off the bowel the more radical the more radical the bowel surgery is the less likely it is to come back but then it's bigger surgery uh, I, I think after that surgery it would be good to either to do something to suppress endometriosis from coming back because you don't want to have repeat bowel surgery. Um, there's one way that I, I didn't mention. In pregnancy, endometriosis lies dormant. So being pregnant is very similar to being on the pill with regards to making endometriosis sleep. And if you can tolerate the pill or the coil, then either being pregnant or being on a hormonal contraception is a sustainable, a sustainable strategy to keep endometriosis, to stop endometriosis from coming back. Because if you're genetically programmed for endometriosis, it can come back even though you might have been in the hands of the most skilled surgical team. All right, thank you. Um, how do you get pelvic floor physio through the NHS? Uh, well, now you're asking me, it took me uh, uh, a year to recruit a pelvic physiotherapist to our unit. Um, I think it's a little difficult because much of the trigger point and pelvic floor relaxation training used to have or happens in Europe. Um, and we used to have lots of physios coming either from U Europe or from New Zealand and doing doing a few years in the uk and now because of some political decisions we have less of that so these people are far and few between but i think emma cox a while ago was working on a a list of physios who can can do that emma correct me if i'm wrong i think ender uk was aiming to put together such a list um, in the first instance ask the uh, in the gynae unit ask your own gynae unit and ask your GEP because nowadays there are more gynae hubs which is a, a different way of organizing gynecological care and and sometimes it's even available in the community thank you Lisa and we also have a, a webinar in December um with a physiotherapist as well so they can provide um, a bit more information about like the, the 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 process around that as well um so could you please advise how to get get over the fear of surgery um which has come from past experiences fear of surgery um it depends a little bit what what caused the fear you know, was it was it 
the compassion fatigue of the staff? Was it pain after surgery? Um, in the first instance, I think get get as much information as possible. And if you can talk to your surgeon, and even if it's on the day, if there was a lot of pain after surgery, it might have been because there was uh, the the air that is being used during keyhole surgery to create spaces to work. Sometimes the air gets trapped in the body and there's shoulder pain. So if, if that was an issue, the surgeon can use a technique of sucking out the air with a, a, a suction machine so there's less pain. Um, the work that I've done regarding um, and pain and anxiety around surgery has shown that if you put a playlist together on your smartphone and listen to soothing music of your own taste prior to surgery, the pain score is two centimeters out of 10 centimeters less when you wake up, anxiety score is dropped and the all over experience is better. Um, Seeing a, um, a counsellor for a few sessions and doing cognitive behavioural therapy can be a big benefit uh, with, with working with fear. Thank you, Lisa. Um, after, surgery, can the end of, after surgery, can the uterus change position from an anti to retroverted and is this of concern? Uh, well, uh, with, when I do surgery, it's often the other way around, that the uterus is, um, well, you are born with an antiverted uterus, which is the, the mm, more common way of having your uterus pointing towards your, the front wall of your tummy, towards the belly button. And the retroverted uterus is if the uterus is pointing towards the back passage. And endometriosis and scar tissue, you can often make the uterus turn backward. And by releasing that scar tissue and that plaque, the uterus often goes into the antiverted situation. But the person asking the question seems to have had an antiverted uterus before and after surgery, it becomes retroverted. And that could be due to scar tissue that was caused during the operation, that uh, sometimes the uh, uterus is retroverted and quite fixed, and sometimes it's still mobile. Uh, I think the it's not a concern in itself, but it would be a concern if there's a new symptom of painful sex, because a retroverted uterus uh, can be linked to painful sex, uh, especially deeper inside and then there is something that you can all all who are interested can google it's a device called onut device and that is very good to help with painful sex and retroverted uterus if that is a problem if there's no no uh, pain associated with it it doesn't matter thank you lisa and if you need an epidural how do you advise to prepare for this an epidural is sometimes offered in preparation for larger surgery with the intention of giving perfect pain relief when you wake up. Uh, and an epidural is, um, involves putting an injection of medication uh, near to the uh, spinal canal. So it goes in, in the back. In, uh, near the lumbar spine and um, I think the best way of preparing is to get an information leaflet or check on Patient UK which is a, con uh, a collection of information leaflets online. Um, what are the pros, what are the cons, it, it's very very safe and um, it has hardly any side effects and lasting side effects are very, very, very rare. So in many cases, the, the benefits largely by, by uh, outweigh the risks by a lot. Thank you. And um, following surgery, does endometriosis immediately begin to grow back? 
I believe if endometriosis was removed, deep endometriosis cut out and surface endometriosis either burned or cut out and there are no cells left, uh, endometriosis doesn't necessarily immediately grow back. I have got quite a few patients who um, uh, I removed endometriosis and then years later I saw them for other reasons and the endometriosis never came back. Um, as, as stated before, you can enhance that positive effect of keeping endometriosis, stopping it from coming back with hormones. Okay. And someone's asked, um, can you elaborate on the BSGE betting scheme? So the BSGE um, has encouraged uh, an, enha an enhancement in care for severe endometriosis. So that, that was their initial focus. The, the worry was that um, people with uh, deep endometriosis, like the lady who has the endometriosis affecting both bladder and bowel, might have been operated in a, a unit where people were only trained to remove ovarian cysts, but not um, endometriosis from blood and bowel. And so the, the society set up a scheme whereby hospitals can apply and then they have to um, submit a, an audit of their uh, cases of severe endometriosis with outcome. Uh, and the data, the patient data gets collected anonymously uh, not only six months, but also 12 months and then two years after to uh, ensure that the operation is actually showing a drop in pain. And um, they have to, the centers also have to demonstrate that they do the networking that I mentioned with the, um, we, with the um, bowel surgeon and the bladder specialist. And this networking um, has to take part in joint operating and also having regular meetings where uh, difficult cases are planned together. And then the surgeon also has to submit videos of their surgical skills and make sure that there are safe hands. And that is what constitutes this list of NHS hospitals. But then um, the, the names you would see on that list, they, these doctors, they also oftentimes work for private units. But um, your GP, sometimes GPs are not fully aware of, uh, a, you know, need a bit of nudging with endometriosis care. And, uh, and rather than uh, your GP referring to the nearest hospital, you might want to request a uh, referral to a hospital with an endometriosis center. And so the GP might be able to make a named referral with the name of the doctor who's on that list on the website. <laughs>